All right, so last week we talked about unity, and we brought up some things, and I don't know if some things were brought up in your own heart, um, but we want to strive towards unity. It's something that God wants. It's something he desires. He prayed for it. John 17, before he died, this was his prayer. This was his desire. And why does he desire it so much? Well, number one, it's who he is. And we are being conformed into the image of his son, right? The Trinity has a perfect unity within the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Perfect unity. And we get to be invited into that unity, right? But he wants heaven on earth, and part of that heaven on earth looks like love, looks like unity. But not only that, when he prayed for us, you know God, he's so good. He doesn't, he's not egotistical and just wants things because he wants things. He wants it for us. We are strengthened when we are in unity. We have support when we are in unity. We, have, we are stronger together than we are apart, right? It says that all throughout the Bible. And so we strive for that. There's, there's certain things that get in the way. And we're going on to this next part in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And it talks about wisdom. So I want to talk about wisdom today. Now, it does touch on unity as well. Okay, so we're at 1 Corinthians 17. So he says, and this is the Passion Translation. For the anointed one has sent me on a mission. I love his, he's so humble, but yet he's so confident in what his calling is. I just love that. I feel like that's a, a really good combination. 1 Corinthians 1.17. For the anointed one has sent me on a mission, not to see how many I could baptize, but to proclaim the good news. The reason why he said that is because before they were getting into arguments because they said, oh, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Jesus. And there was divisions among them because of who they were following. He says, I didn't come to claim numbers and say, I'm the one that baptized you and, you know, you belong to me. He said, I came to preach the gospel. I'm on that mission, right? But to proclaim the good news, and I declare this message stripped of all philosophical arguments that empty the cross of its true power. Philosophical arguments that empty the cross of its true power. Those are some heavy words right there. I'm not sure what we totally know what that means. Stripped of all philosophical arguments that empty the cross of its true power. For I... Trust in all the all-sufficient cross of Christ alone. When we talk about philosophical arguments, I, I just imagine, you know, some, uh, you know, elderly professors sitting around and, you know, discussing things and deep, deep meanings of things. And, and all that's really fun. But when you have a group of elder professors sitting around and talking and they're using their intellect to come up with answers for the world's problems or maybe uh, astrophysics or maybe trigonometry or maybe uh, uh, socialism. And they put all their minds together. They're not going to come up with the cross of Christ. Right. It, it, it's for, for that discussion, for that uh, exercise it seems so far removed. It's like a fairy tale, right? They're not going to come up with, well, what we need is someone to come, you know, God to come as a human, die for us. I mean, it just, it seems so far-fetched when you take it into the philosophical realm. So it does, it, it, it empties the cross when we get into that. To preach the message of the cross seems like sheer nonsense to those who are on their way to destruction. Ooh, it seems like nonsense. Have you ever talked to someone 
and they're looking at you like you're just nuts. You're saying Jesus died on the cross and forgave you of your sins so you can go to heaven. And they're like, what planet are you on? You ever get that look? Well, this is the reason. He's explaining that those that are on their way to destruction think that this is complete fairy tale, nonsense. It, you, you are just believing something that is so far-fetched. It doesn't even make sense in this world. No, not to this world system. It doesn't make sense. And do we say, you know what? Those that are headed for destruction, if they are headed for destruction, the, the, um, the symptom is they look at the cross and its foolishness. That's the symptom for those headed to destruction. So do we say, well, those headed to destruction, there's no hope for them. So if they think the cross is foolishness when I'm sharing that, then I just walk away, you know, shake the dust off my feet and go try someone else. No, 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 no. It will seem as foolishness to them, but it doesn't mean that we give up. Those are the ones we target. And so a lot of that has to do with the spiritual realm. So Paul again says that people have spiritual blinders on. Blinders that they cannot see. You know Paul, the Apostle Paul? He was the Jew of Jews. He was mentored um, by a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. He was a teacher of the law, right? Top of the top. He couldn't see Jesus if he stood right in front of him. And he studied about the Messiah his whole life. Do you understand how that philosophical headspace can get in the way of the cross of Christ? But guess what? He was knocked off his horse, blinded, so that he came to a place where he said, well, well who are you? And Jesus came to him and said, why are you persecuting me? That would shake up anybody, right? right out of their philosophical arguments. But the problem is with the philosophical arguments is that they insulate you from reality. And so you think you're on the right track and you think that you have it all together because a spirit of know-it-all gets on you. And then you are deceived thinking that you know it all. That's the danger of it. That's the danger. And, and um, Paul goes on to say, but to us who are on our way to salvation, it is the mighty power of God. So we understand that. It is the mighty power. When we talk about the cross, when we talk about the blood, like, oh, yes, that's the power of God. When you mention that to someone else, they may think the, the blood, right? Oh, yeah. We take communion. We eat the body of Jesus and we drink his blood. And they're like, what kind of a cult are you in? That doesn't make sense at all to the natural mind. Doesn't make sense at all. Why would you even do that? But those who are born again, born of the Spirit, understanding these things, they understand what that means to partake of the elements of Jesus, to receive what happened in his body, to receive what happened on the cross, to internalize it, right? For it is written, I will dismantle the wisdom of the wise, and I will invalidate the intelligence of the scholars. So where is the wise philosopher who understands? Where is the expert scholar who comprehends? And where is the skilled debater of our time who could win a debate with God? <laughs> I love it when the scientists called on God and they say, listen, we can do what you do. We can make a human being. And they gathered all this dirt and they start shaping and forming and putting through all these tests. And they shaped this being that came to life. And God said, there's one problem with that. You got to get your own dirt. 
I made that. <laughs> you can't debate God. Hasn't God demonstrated that the wisdom of this world system is utter foolishness? For in his wisdom, God designed that all the world's wisdom would be insufficient to lead people to the discovery of himself. It doesn't matter how much you study, you can't find God. Does that, does that sound depressing? What does that mean? That means God has to reveal himself. If God doesn't reveal himself, you can't find him. That's the power of a revelation, a revelation of God. And so that's why when you meet someone who's destined for destruction, they don't understand the cross, you don't keep arguing with them. You go right to war in prayer for them, for their soul. And that prayer changes what needs to be changed. And we begin to pray that God would reveal himself to them. God, reveal yourself to them. In the night, reveal yourself to them. Reveal your love, your goodness, your joy, your peace. Reveal the power of your cross to them. Take off the spiritual blinders. Do whatever you have to do, right? We all have people, neighbors, friends, family members that are not walking with Jesus. And they think that they are fulfilling their lives. They, they have a goal of what will fulfill them. But we see it and we're like, no, 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 you're going down the wrong road. And they're like, oh, you want me to be in bondage over here with Jesus who tells me what I can and can't do? And they don't realize it's freedom, total freedom. We've experienced it. But in that place of deception, they just see the complete opposite. And that's why we need to pray. And that's why we need to continue to pray until we see something happen. Amen. It's like Luke 18, that, that woman who begged the judge over and over and over. And Jesus said, this was a godless judge who could care less. But he said, because this woman is annoying me, I'm going to give her what she wants. <laughs> Let's be like that in prayer. Amen. To a God who's not a godless judge, who's a righteous judge, and wants them saved more than you do. Amen. So we pray like that, but differently. We pray like that, but to a different person. Someone who's like, yeah, keep going. Keep going. Those bowls are almost filled of intercession until they're spilling over. Don't give up. You could be the only person praying for their salvation. I'm glad someone prayed for me. It says, I'll continue on. He took great delight in baffling the wisdom of the world by using the simplicity of preaching the story of the cross in order to save those who believe it. To save those who believe it. This whole thing about Christianity, has, you have to cross over with faith. At some point, you have to say, I believe it. And it's not going to get there by a... a um, truckload of evidence. Do you know what I'm saying? You can't wait for the evidence to come and convince you that every, every dot matches and everything. You can't wait for that. At some point, you have to take a step of faith and say, okay, I believe it. I believe it. And then when you believe it, you begin to see it. For the Jews constantly demand to see miracles, miraculous signs, while those who are not Jews constantly cling to the world's wisdom. But we preach the crucified Messiah. The Jews stumble over him, and the rest of the world sees him as foolishness. But for those who have been chosen to follow him, both Jews and Greeks, he is God's mighty power, God's true wisdom, and our Messiah. 
For the foolish things of God have proven to be wiser than human wisdom. I just, I always think of Peter when I think of that. When he was trying to tell the Jews about Jesus and they, and they saw the power on his life and they're like, isn't this guy, isn't he the one? He's not even a student. He, he wasn't schooled or anything. But he was, we see that he was with Jesus. Like the foolish things proven to be wiser than human wisdom and the feeble things of God have proven to be far more powerful than any human ability. Wow. Wisdom. It, it, it contrasts two different types of wisdom. There's the wisdom of the world and there's the wisdom of God. And we want to function by the wisdom of God. Right? Well, what is that? What, what's the difference? What is wisdom? In Proverbs 1, 1 through 7, it says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the, sons of, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the naive, to the youth, knowledge, and discretion. A wise man will hear an increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. To understand a proverb and a figure, the words of the wise and their riddles. This is the beginning of, the, of Solomon's book, The Proverbs. And he's laying it out to those who want to understand or those who want to grow in wisdom. And then verse 7 just hits you right in the face. It says, this is the beginning. This is where you start. If you want wisdom, this is where you have to start. Every person has to go to this starting line if you want wisdom. And that starting line is this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord. To say, you're God and I'm not. To come to that place of humility is actually the beginning of your wisdom journey. Yeah. Not all that you've studied and memorized, and that is representative of the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge, and knowledge puffs up, right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And then he says, fools despise wisdom and instruction fools despise that someone wants to give hey can i help you with your life can i give you some advice you ever seen someone just throw a, a it's like throwing away gold it's when when they received wisdom and they just throw it away i just want to do my own thing that looks like bondage to me but someone who is wise We'll look at everything. We'll be open. They won't be a know-it-all. How did Solomon get so wise? We hear all the stories about Solomon, right? But in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 1, 7 through 12, this is the NASB, 2 Chronicles 1, 7 through 12, we see how it came to be, how he started this journey. And so David, his father, died. And Solomon got put on the throne. And we see by his prayer that he's a little nervous. He's a little bit, you know, um, scared. And he requests something from God. And so in that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, Ask what I shall give you. Wouldn't you love that? Ask and I'll give it to you. What do you want? Man, I have a list. <laughs> Solomon said to God, You have dealt with my father David with great loving kindness and have made me king in his place. Wow, that, that sounds like Thanksgiving. Now, O oh Lord, your promise to my father David is fulfilled, for you have made me king over a people as numerous as the dust of the earth. Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. For who can rule this great people of yours? So he asks for something. 
He asked for wisdom and knowledge for the purpose of being king, for ruling these people. He got the heart of David. Because David, when he was put as king on the throne, it says that he realized that God has blessed him for the sake of the people. He's like, wow, you know what? I realize I'm so blessed. God has blessed me. But you know what? I realize it's, it's, it's really not for me. It's for them. So that I can lead them into prosperity. And so Solomon got that from his dad. He said, you know what I need more than anything? I need wisdom. Because how am I going to rule all these people without wisdom? I don't know what I'm doing. And that fear of the Lord and that place, that starting point of humility attracts the wisdom of God. If you go from the other starting point of, oh yeah, I know I can do this. And you know what? Let me just take what I know and implement it. It's going to be awesome. That is not a journey towards wisdom. That's a journey towards falling or failure. Very different. God said to Solomon, because you had this in mind and did not ask for riches, wealth, or honor, or the life of those who hate you, nor have you even asked for a long life, but you have asked for yourself wisdom and knowledge that you may rule my people over whom I have made you king, wisdom and knowledge have been granted to you. And I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings who were before you has possessed, nor those who will come after you. So he blessed him. It's God's nature to bless. It's his heart. He's such a good daddy. He wants to, that's his nature. If you have any thoughts in your mind that are different from his nature to bless, then you have created and maybe worshiping a God of your own making. We have to align our thoughts with who he is. He wants to bless you. And so this is how this wisdom journey started with Solomon. He was in a place where he was humble and said, you know what, I don't have what it takes. And you know what that's called? Poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Someone who's poor in spirit looks at themselves and says, I am not the source of what I need. I don't have it in me. I need someone who's higher than me, stronger than me, more wise than me. I need God. If we turn to James chapter 3, he contrasts a different type of wisdom. And it starts in verse 13, 313. If you consider yourself to be wise and one who understands the ways of God. Ooh, that sounds juicy already, huh? This is James. He was an elder in Jerusalem, but it was Jesus' half-brother. You guys know that, right? His name's actually Jacob. They should have translated it Jacob, but King James wanted his name in there and put it, it's true, wanted his name in there and he changed it, but his name's actually Jacob. He says, if you consider yourself to be wise and one who understands the ways of God, Advertise it with a beautiful, fruitful life guided by wisdom's gentleness. Never brag or boast about what you've done, and you'll prove that you're truly wise. It's so good. Because once you brag about your wisdom, you're proving that you're not wise. <laughs> But if there is bitter jealousy or competition hiding in your heart, then don't deny it. And don't try to compensate for it by boasting and being phony. For that has nothing to do with God's heavenly wisdom, but can best be described as the wisdom of this world, both selfish and devilish. 
I don't even have to preach. I just read this. It's just amazing. If you can get that picture, because this is what heaven sees. When people boast about what they know, heaven is like, oh, that poor guy. When people listen intently and expect to gain something from everyone and anyone, heaven is like, wow, there's some wisdom there. They're going to go places. So wherever jealousy and selfishness are uncovered, you will also find many troubles and every kind of meanness. And this is going into the teaching about unity. But the wisdom from above, now this is in contrast, from above, from heaven, is always pure, filled with peace, considerate and teachable. It is filled with love. Wait, let's go back. You're saying someone who really has wisdom is teachable? I thought someone who really has wisdom is not teachable. Do you see how the contrast, the heavenly wisdom is so full of humility. And those that have humility will continue to grow in wisdom. Those that say, I know it all, will plateau in what they know. Because guess what the word wisdom is in, when we read it in Second Chronicles? When Solomon asked for wisdom, guess how you translate that? A listening heart. A listening heart is wisdom. A listening heart to God. He said, God, give me a listening heart and I may always have one eye on you, one eye on the people. I want to know what you're doing. I need to know. I want to always be listening to you. And this isn't the same in the New Testament with the Holy Spirit. Always listening. Right? When I have counseling appointments or ministering to somebody, man, I don't know what to do. But as soon as I turn my ear and I say, Holy Spirit, you do. What do you want to say? Oh, I get the best stuff. I want to write it down. I want to write a book about it because it's so good. And that could seem very conceited. But when you know my heart that's poor in spirit, you'll know what I'm saying. Oh my gosh, what God just said, what he carries, what he has is so rich. It's so good. It's not just because it came out of my mouth. No, because it came out of his. And when you have that listening heart, continually be listening then even people who may seem young or lowly or unsuccessful even, I don't know, you have that listening heart. You say, God, what does this person have for me? And then there becomes a culture of acceptance and celebration. We begin celebrating each other because then we begin to discover every single person is carrying something good. <laughs> it's amazing. Then we start to celebrate Christ in you. And I get to experience Jesus all over again through you because there's a different facet of God's love in you that I don't know and I don't have until I begin to listen. A listening heart. Teachable. It is filled with love and never displays prejudice or hypocrisy in any form, and it always bears the beautiful harvest of righteousness. Good seeds of wisdom's fruit will be planted with peaceful acts by those who cherish making peace. Making peace. How do we do that with those that are opposed to us, those that maybe are Annoying, those that have a different um, viewpoint than us. Well, it's, you can listen when you don't have to prove yourself. When I have to prove what I know and that it's right, 
then I'm not listening. You know, when, when early on when Andre and I would have discussions, I would always be thinking of the next thing to say that I'm going to say while she's talking. <laughs> it doesn't work very well. <laughs> I went down that road. It doesn't work very well. So instead, we listen to the person. What are they saying? I want to understand what they're saying, right? That's, that's the goal in unity is to understand each other's hearts not think of a rebuttal while they're speaking. Then you didn't hear anything, right? But this is good right here. It gets into chapter 4. What is the cause of your conflicts and quarrels with each other? Doesn't the battle begin inside of you as you fight to have your own way? And fulfill your own desires? See, unity, unity doesn't work very good in a self-centered culture. Everyone's trying to get their own desires fulfilled. That doesn't promote unity. Because what promotes unity is love. And the object of love is always the other person. You jealously want what others have, so you begin to see yourself as better than others. You scheme with envy and harm and harm others to selfishly obtain what you crave. That's why you quarrel and fight. Selfishness. That's not love. I've learned in, in marriage and counseling and even friendship to not have an opinion. Because I want God's opinion. God, what are you saying? We can go a long way when you don't have an opinion. Even Proverbs says, the man who doesn't talk much looks wise it's so true just don't say anything just sit there and listen and everyone thinks man whew, that Val he is wise he didn't even say anything <laughs> it's a good word <laughs> but did you see the contrast between wisdom from above and worldly wisdom it's really all about the heart. That's where it starts, in the heart. It's your heart motives. It's your heart motives. And we aren't to be self-centered or selfish. We are to give our lives away. We are to lose our lives, and then we'll find it. And then there's this whole other topic of uh, the supernatural gifts, the word of wisdom in 1 Corinthians 12. We don't want to... Um, Confuse it with, with that. In 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 8, it says, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are a variety of ministries and the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. What is a word of wisdom? Um, I didn't know I was, I had or was functioning in this until my friend um, pointed it out one time. We were on a mission trip. We were in the Philippines. And my friend, Pastor Doug, we were um, listening to this woman. And she was saying all these things that were happening, and she doesn't know why, basically. And what do we do? And, and we were just listening over breakfast and all that. And then something just, and I'm asking the Lord, and something pops in my head that, that strings all of the events together in a, in a unified goal. And I said, you know what I think is happening? That's because of this, 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 and this. And then that's the result. And, and I, I kind of just said it like, like, maybe. And Doug looks at me and said, that's a word of wisdom. I said, oh, my gosh. <laughs> 
That's amazing, right? And so wisdom, the definition of wisdom is not necessarily knowledge, okay? You can know a lot of things, okay? You could study this room, uh, every single detail. You can count the lights. You can count the tiles on the ceiling. You can know the, the exact name of the paint on the walls. You can know the square footage. You can know all that you see. That's knowledge. But wisdom goes beyond what you can see. Wisdom knows how it's standing, Wisdom knows the foundation. Wisdom knows the structure. Wisdom can see into the walls and sees the two by sixes and how they're nailed together and how the drywall is nailed to that and how it all functions and the electricity and where, where it runs. It can see through walls. To the wisdom is, is how things work. Knowledge is to memorize facts, but wisdom is to know how things work. And a word of wisdom, a supernatural word of wisdom, is when God gives you the reason behind what's going on. And it, say, it says in James 1, if you're going through many trials, ask me for wisdom and I'll give it to you generously. So when you're going through trials, instead of saying, God, change this and change that, you say, oh God, give me wisdom. What's happening right now? Why is this happening? What's going on? And I know you, you're always up to something. So give me wisdom. And if you don't necessarily get it right away, just continue to ask and believe in what he said. As a good father, I will give generously. That's a promise. Yeah. That's a promise. Sometimes we ask for wisdom, what's going on, and then someone else comes along and, and just gives us a little nugget. We don't realize that that's how God's answering. But that's a word of wisdom. So be paying attention to that when your friend's sharing with you what's going on. And you say, God, what's, why is this happening? Give me a word of wisdom. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> I wonder if I have time for this. You guys all good? <clears throat> Try to make it, well, that's a lot of scripture. I'll try to, I'll, I'll paraphrase Pastor Joe version, okay? <clears throat> so before Paul goes to Corinth, which is what we're reading, that church that he established there, he was in Athens. And both Corinth and Athens, they had multiple gods, many gods that they worshiped. And so Paul is in this place where his mission is to preach the gospel, Right? So he's walking around all of these idols. It's almost like a, a, a graveyard with tombstones. There's all these idols, just one after the other. So many, hundreds. And he's like, how am I going to reach these people? I mean, they believe in so many gods. If I, just, if, if I speak about Jesus, they may build a shrine and say, oh, yeah, we'll worship him too. Right? I was talking to a Jehovah's Witness came up to me at Home Depot and uh, says, oh, you know, can I share with you some things in the Bible? I said, yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> and then, um, <clears throat> oh, why are you guys laughing? <laughs> and, then, uh, and then he wanted to give me some pamphlets about heaven. He said, will you, will you take these? And I said, no, I will not take those. Why not? I said, well, that's the Watchtower Society. And they, they have a different translation of the Bible that is in error. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, yeah, you know, it says in John 1, 1, the word was with God in the beginning and the word was God. And it's talking about Jesus. The word was God. And you guys don't believe in that. You don't believe that Jesus was God. Well, this and that. And I said, let me tell you what your Bible says. Your Bible says the word was a God. And I said, that means that you believe in multiple gods, and that would be totally against your own Bible. And so this is what he was trained to do. He says, oh, well, let me, let me get you to look at this verse over here. They do the, oh, I've talked to so many. This is what they always do. I said, no, no, I don't want to look at the other verse. I want to talk about John 1.1. 1, 1. Well, come here, let's look at this over here. I mean, it's like three times. And I said, this is what I encounter with you guys, 
is that you will not address this one thing. Let's address this one thing. Is there multiple gods or only one God? And he said, well, you know, it's the holidays. I don't want to argue. You know, let's not get into a tiff or whatever. I said, you're right. You're right. We don't, we don't have to go there. But this is what I encounter every time. And I said, listen, I really hope I see you in heaven. And I bless you. Have an amazing day. And that was it, right? But Paul finds himself in this similar situation. Like, how do I reach people? And he's seeing all these idols. And he finds one idol. And it says, to the unknown God. And he gets, uh, he gets wisdom from heaven. He's asking, he's walking through these idols and he's asking Holy Spirit, how do I do this thing? I know my mission and I'm not just going to go in and preach the gospel like the same way every time. Listen, because it, it would fall on deaf ears. He's asking Holy Spirit, how do I reach these people? And so then he goes before them and he says, you know, he, he almost like encourages them. I see you worship so many gods. And he says to them, you're very religious. And that was a good word in those days. You're very religious. You're very devoted. And I saw a shrine to the unknown God. And I want to tell you who that unknown God is. That unknown God is someone I know personally. And he's the creator of the universe. And he begins to explain in their own language. It's just genius. And I'm not going to attribute that to Paul because Paul said himself, I don't come to you with eloquent speech. I come with the power of God and a demonstration of the Spirit. So what was that? Was that he studied for a week before he went? He just, no, he was going around and he's saying, God, how do I reach these people? And guess what? A bunch of them believed that day in the gospel. And it opened their minds up because he was functioning with heaven's wisdom. He was functioning from a place where he was poor in spirit. He had the fear of God. And he said, God, I need you in this place. And that leads to wisdom. A listening heart is wisdom. A listening heart is heaven's wisdom. But it looks like something. It's, it's all full of love and joy, and it, it seeks peace, right? Not arguments. It seeks peace. And so when you're listening, man, you will have so many friends. I guarantee you, people love it when they can talk about themselves. <laughs> and if you listen and encourage, if anyone's lonely out there, learn how to listen and encourage what they're saying. Tell me more. But I'm, I'm kind of joking. This is more, you know, obviously towards the Lord. Wisdom begins when you say, God, I need you. And here I am. I am listening and looking for what you're saying and what you're doing. Amen. That is heaven's wisdom. Put simply, that is heaven's wisdom. We want to get rid of the, the know-it-all spirit. The one that puts you in danger because you think you're in a good place when you're not. And we want to go back to the wisdom of Solomon, who maybe he didn't end well. But how that wisdom got there was by being poor in spirit and asking for a listening heart. God, I want to serve your people, so give me wisdom for that. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> So let's stand. We're going to worship. <clears throat> but God, if the truth be known, <laughs> we need you more than we realize. <laughs> and we really do want heaven's wisdom to flow through our lives. We want to pull on your resources. You are the smartest one in the universe. Why wouldn't we rely on you? So if you're bold enough to pray this, God, develop in me a listening heart. One that doesn't boast about all that I know, but listens for what you're doing. Acknowledging that I am poor in spirit. 
I need you, God. I need you, God. Develop in me a heart that hears your voice. Give us wisdom. If there's any trials going on out here, we ask, according to James chapter 1, we ask for your wisdom that you said you would give it generously. And we just cling on that promise. You said you'll give it generously. You're a generous God. And so we ask right now, what's going on? Give us wisdom. Because we want to, uh, we want to succeed in this trial. We don't want to just get out of it. We want to conquer it. We want to grow in it. We want to be champions in it so that we are overcomers and not scaredy cats. We want to overcome, and we need your wisdom on how to overcome the trial that we're facing right now. We don't turn and run from it. We say to that mountain, move. <laughs> so I just ask, Father, that you would just bestow wisdom upon wisdom on everyone here, that we would continue to grow in wisdom, that would not plateau, but we would continue to grow like Solomon did. But we would f finish well with that wisdom, God. Give us your wisdom from heaven in Jesus' mighty name.